Welcome to The Interesting Podcast, episode number 161. This episode is with my new friend and absolute gem of a human being, Tara Platt. She was such a joy to hang out out with. We talk about a ton of stuff. We talk about her raising a kid during this pandemic, going to 14 different schools when she was growing up, how she originally thought she wanted to be a neurosurgeon, working on soap operas, her first voiceover gig, getting to work with her husband, previous guest of the show, Yuri Lowenthal, on Hawaii Five-0, a really cool experience she had with her new favorite animal, the importance of actually finishing your projects, and so much more. She's amazing. You're gonna love her. So without further ado, let's jump right into this one. Please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 161, with Tara Platt. Theme song time! <laughs> How's your day going? It's going. It's, it's been a good day so far. Yeah. And you? Uh, not bad. Not bad. How'd your session go? It was good. Thank you. Nice. Um, yeah. Nice. Always good to start, you know, with oh, work. <laughs> yes. It, it, sessions are always important because that's what keeps us going. It's so yeah. funny though. You know, like I'm sure, I don't know if you already said this or not. Like whenever you audition, you're super excited because you want to book it, but then whatever they're trying to book it, you're like, oh no, not right then. That's yeah. when I want to do this other thing. Like <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? Like we spend our whole lives trying to get things. And then when they come through, we're like, oh, that's not what I meant. That's not what I wanted. And then of course you'll have like four days in a week where you don't have any sessions. And then there's one day where five projects are trying to all book you at the same time. You're like, seriously, what is it about Tuesday at three o'clock? Like, come on, man. (laughs) Why is that the cool time? I don't know. That's right. Spread them out. Come on. Exactly. Exactly. No, but it it was actually a great session. So thank you. Great. Great. Yeah. I same, same. It's the time limits for me when I'm like, all right, cool. When you get an audition, they're like, we need this tape in by tomorrow. I was like, I'm not even home. Ah!" Yeah. Yeah. No, I've had a few of those like rush things where you're like, this is urgent. You have to immediately turn it around. You're like, yeah, that's cool. Except I am actually a human being and I have a toddler. So like (laughs) a little bit of preparation helps me with all things. That's right. (laughs) you know, I like to, I like to be able to plan. I'm also super type A. So I also really just like to be able to plan because I like to pretend I have some semblance of control over my life. Of but. course. Of course. See, I need to get a toddler just to have that excuse. Right oh now, like, yeah. Eh, you yeah. Know. No, I, I wouldn't <laughs> recommend getting a toddler for that reason. Uh, oh. There are plenty of other reasons I'm sure you could get a toddler, but that it, it will actually go contrary to all of the uh, things. You need. Okay. They, okay. they just turn things topsy turvy. They, yeah. they make the world go upside down. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, my brother, uh, he has a kid already and they're having another one. And my wife and I got a dog last year. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Being a father has been a test. Yes. Um, yes. And I, I think we've realized that human children may not be in the cards for us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think that's a very wise decision. Yeah. I, you know, I read somewhere recently that, uh, what did it say? It said plants are the new pets and pets are the new kids. Yes. And then someone commented and they're like, what are kids? And they're yeah. like, exactly. <laughs> what are kids? <laughs> that's right. That's oh, right. Man. I think it's still illegal to put your kid in a pen and leave. Uh, um, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot that there's, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't question, I don't question anybody's parenting because it's yeah. a difficult <laughs> thing to get through. And and honestly, like all the parents having to get through this last year, like I oh, for I real. mad props to the parents and all the teachers in the world. Like they all deserve mega yes. raises. And totally uh, agreed. How has that been? Because you have a kid yeah, and you know. I mean, we're we're lucky because um Sagan doesn't turn five for another week. Nice. So we, we actually kind of evaded the most brutal part of it, which is like online classes oh because, smart yeah he would have technically still been in preschool and we just pulled him out you know for the last year um sure but we didn't we didn't miss out like on him needing to be at elementary school getting his common core information you know like we, we didn't, right like actually I have learning have kids yeah who are a little older <laughs> who like it's really hard to keep your kid focused I mean it's hard for me to stay focused on oh this yeah thing, but for like sure. it's really hard to keep your six-year-old or your eight-year-old or your 12-year-old or whatever focused on zoom and i'm not saying every child can't focus but like 
they're not getting what they need emotionally and yes. um, socially and socially and interact like on an interactive level. Oh yeah. None of us were getting what we needed, but kids in particular were missing out on those crucial developmental skills that, you know, I, I just feel really bad for parents having to navigate that. Cause I don't want to say we got off easy this year was anything, but yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I'm hopeful that it's a once in a lifetime sort of thing that you go through and you, we won't experience that again. Yes. But, um, but like, I, I really, I have such respect for other parents and friends of mine with, with multiples or whatever, and having to juggle school and all of that. Cause you know, we're fortunate. It's the two of us, we can work from home and we have one child, yeah. you know, and we, <laughs> and, and you know, like we, we were able to, to be privileged enough to know that we were going to be able to cover our food and our, our roof over our heads and things like that when other people weren't necessarily so fortunate. So like all in all, we made it through the year, but I certainly would not like to take that train ride again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with you. I keep saying that this will be great to say we've been through it on the yeah. other side to be like, remember the pandemic? Like, remember all those hard times? Like, look at us. We're still yeah. here. But the, the process so. is like, mm, yeah, if I, I mean, could have not. It's funny because it's made me think about like history, right? Um, yeah. Like, all of history. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is it's weird. I skipped a grade when I was um, in school. I skipped Ooh. fifth grade. And so I never learned like history. I somehow sure. went from... <laughs> I was learning about like the earth and the planet. And then suddenly I was just not, I didn't get history and it just never took history classes. And so all of history has always sort of just been this vague, hazy thing of like, there was always a war with someone doing something and somebody right. was bad. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. And so um, I kind of skirted around it. And then when I was older, I just wasn't interested in it because I never had any information about it. So sure. I never pursued it and I wasn't engaged in it because I had other things that were more pressing to me at the time. Totally. And, and it really kind of forced me to sort of go, oh my God, all those things that I sort of vaguely knew about, oh, there was, I don't know, this war that happened, World War One, or there were, you know, the you know, a Hindenburg thing or like stuff that I, I sort of vaguely have in just like zeitgeist information, but not because I read about it in a history book, but right. just sort of like just I there. overheard it and I pieced it together. Sure. And I was like, oh my God, there were people who were living through that experience and how many of them while they were living through it were thinking, oh my God, I'm living through this experience versus how many people were just trying to get through the day and get out of bed and eat something. Like yes. what, Like it just, it just made me really sort of like connect on some level to the people of the past somehow yes. <laughs> in a very vague and non, you know, non-specific way, but just like, wow, that's fascinating. How many of those people really felt like they lived through something versus how many people were just moment to moment, just getting through it. Like we all were, you know, and it was interesting. Yeah. Isn't that them. weird? I think yeah. about that a lot, especially historical like figures, like, yeah. because they're, they're not real, but they're mm -hmm. real. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like, Oh, Julius Caesar, that was just a dude. Yeah, You're like what? It's a, it's a sketch in a book. It's like a pic. It's like a, a yeah, a, like, a, like a charcoal picture of a person. It's not even a real person. Yes. You're not watching like a hologram of this person moving around and talking. It's just like a drawn sketch on a coin, and you're like, yeah, yeah, that was a person, but what? Yeah, it? like really? <laughs> yeah. I, don't I don't think know, so. I don't think so. <laughs> we just all agreed to it. That's yeah. a conspiracy. We'll start. <laughs> yeah, right. There's no Julius Caesar. There was no yeah. Pompey. There was no. no, you know, like all those words that are sort of bandied about. I don't That's know. right. Show me proof. Yeah. <laughs> mm, forged. Look. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> it's nuts. But again, 2020, we'll just forget about it. Like yeah. fifth grade is what a grade to skip. That's like right before you go into middle school. Yeah. Well, I, I moved around a lot when I was younger um, oh. because I'm an only, and my mom and I were following my dad as he sort of did uh, his pre-med med school and residency. Cause he oh boy. He changed life career at his midlife crisis was, I don't want to be an aerospace engineer and do um, gyroscopic technologies for spaceships and what? be sort of an astrophysicist person. I'd rather be a doctor. So he quit <laughs> his easier. job and he, he went back to med school. And so we followed him around. And because of that, we had to move dependent on where his school was. And then because we were renting, because we knew we didn't want to be in a place any for too long because right. he was going to be changing. Um, sometimes our rent would, we'd only have the house for a year or wherever we were staying. So I was in 14 different schools growing up. Oh, so I was always Lord. the new kid and we just moved around a lot. And so sometimes what happened is certain schools and certain school districts and certain states would have covered certain bits of information. And so they kind of didn't know what to do with me. Sure. And, um, 
So I ended up skipping fifth grade. Was it as I was leaving? Was I moving to Oklahoma? Oh my God. I can't actually remember because it's all just a little bit of a blur too. It's been a lot. Um, even my own history, I don't know. Yeah. That's funny. Um, yeah, Didn't I happen, just don't Tara. know history. That's that's my whole thing is I don't yeah. know history. Um, no, but, uh, but so I skipped fifth grade and then I came into sixth grade, which I guess was middle school. So I came mm-hmm. out of an elementary school and went into a middle school, but it was a totally, I would have been a new kid anyway. So it wasn't right. like I jumped with my friends because I was always the new kid anyway. So I just sort of showed up and now I was a sixth grader. Oh, okay. Okay. Were, were you good with that? I feel like a lot of people that move a bunch, you either go, you're totally comfortable in a room with strangers or the opposite where you're very keep to yourself. Um, I think I was, I think I was good when I was doing it, yeah. but I think maybe it turned me into an introvert without me realizing it. Cause I was always very gregarious and friendly with people because I knew, oh my God, I have to immediately it's sink or swim. I'm the new kid. I have, right. to, I have to get my, Oh, can, are we saying dirty words or not dirty words? Hell okay. yeah, we are. Okay. I got to get my shit together, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I, if I, if I don't get that together, then like, you know, this year is going to be miserable for me. Um, and it sure. sometimes still was because as the new kid, who are they going to pick on? They're going to pick on you. And I had glasses. So it was four eyes and uh-huh. you know, like all that, all that. I'm with you. Stuff. Yeah. Um, and so, and I was weird on my own, on my own. Same. I'm still weird of weird and that's fine too. But, uh, like, I, you know, I was, I was the kid who was like, yeah, I'm going to go to a, not a shoe store. I'm going to go to like an art store and see that they have a pair of shoes in them that have been hand painted with pictures of fish on them. And I think that's cool. So I'm going to yes. wear my sneakers to school. Oh my God. There's a purse that has a clock in it. It's like an actual working clock. I'm going to wear that purse to school. Like I'm just a weirdo. And that's I fine. love it. But it meant that I didn't really have a lot of friends growing up, which is also same. You know, thing Same. which forces you to figure other things out but mm-hmm. it did I mean like I sort of would step into whatever I just wanted to put on that year as a personality and I remember I mean most of my and I say personalities it's not like I had sure. <laughs> different personalities I am not suffering from that um but most of what I would put on would be sort of like a good student and very together and things like that because that's who I genuinely am like I'm a very type a you give me the assignment I like getting my homework done I turn it in I might do the extra credit you know that sort of a thing right but then I remember there was one year and I was just like done with it I was just I think I was probably <laughs> I probably was about 13 And, you know, it wasn't easy being the new kid. And I will say girls are particularly mean to other girls. And I was just a little tired. And I was like, I'm just going to be like, it wasn't goth, but I was just sort of like, F it this year. Yeah. (laughs) I was totally like, whatever. And (laughs) and I remember like, I got into that and then I was like, what have I done? Like, now I don't even like myself. (laughs) I was just like, who am I? (laughs) <laughs> Thank goodness I'm leaving soon. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I guess I sort of benefited from it because I think that it also helped me more easily sort of put on the skin of a character. Sure. Because it forced me to investigate human, like, like the, the idea of like the, the psychoses and the decisions behind our behaviors. Yes. As humans. And it helped me sort of recognize that and become intimately familiar with what makes people tick and why people do what they do, which then helps me in my work. Because as an actor, your job is to sort of dissect the human yes. <laughs> for, for, for people's um, more bite-sized consumption of it uh, so that you can make uh, choices that, that resonate with people. And so, I mean, like, I think I benefited from it, but I think nowadays, like, well, now I'm excited to go back to parties because we've been in a pandemic and so I can't yeah. wait to see other human beings. Same. I'm, sure, I'm sure I'll get to the party and then I'll be like, cool, we've been here three minutes. Peace out. Like, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I think I got it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize I was an introvert until much later in life. And then I was like, oh yeah, I'm the person who I finished doing the play. I walk off stage, I change clothes and then I leave the back of the theater. I don't want to go out with anyone afterward for drinks. I don't yes. want to meet up with people. I don't want to, I did my thing. I like, totally. I did the play. Cool. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not the person who wants to go out to the bar till three in the morning afterward. And yep. I, I have, I have started to realize now that that actually is shooting me in the foot a little bit in my mm-hmm. career. Sure. I started to recognize that my fellow actors 
who many of them are actually much more um, out outwardly engaged with other people. Sure. They're having much more successful trajectories. And it's right. not that I think it's not that I think that um, I, I, I would say like my peers, like what I mean is like people that are like the same skill level that I am. Totally. And I and I'm noticing and I'm like, what is it that they're doing different? And I'm like, oh, right. They go out afterward and they hang out with people afterward and they stay in touch. They keep in touch. They email and they connect. They're very connected. Right. Whereas I like I show up, I do my thing and I'm out of there. I'm right. like, you say, you say I'm done and I'm like, peace. I, I, right. I, I go home and I hide at my house. So right. I'm like, oh, right. That's actually like the one thing I would tell my younger self is that you kind of have to invest in people in a different way. And it's not that I don't like people. It's not, but I just, I, I just tend to be like, oh, I did my thing. I'm going to go now. And I don't stay that extra little bit to like really check in <laughs> right. like I noticed, like sometimes Yuri makes fun of me because he's very good at that like he's he's 1000 percent a people person like yeah if I you that people up. if you take Yuri away from people <laughs> he starts to wilt like, sure. like oh like you need people I was actually okay this last year mostly <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, except for the fear of dying all the time I was actually okay yeah you know? even trade um, <laughs> uh, but like he really needs to be around people and and I and I recognize that like he's so good with people. And a lot of the times the work that comes up for him and the connections that like reach out to him to then lead to a bigger thing come from the fact that he just puts in that extra time with people because he genuinely wants to connect. Right. And I'm like, Oh, that's the element. That's, that's, that's what that extra would, thing. It's that extra thing that would make you more successful. So if there are any people who are looking to get into any career in any field doing anything people will help you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can connect with people so even if you're an introvert train yourself to engage on that level because it will help you become more successful and it's the one thing that I wish that I had learned when I was younger because I think I would have had a, a very different trajectory and a different career yeah, no, that makes total sense. It's also kind of weird that I have a similar story in that growing up, I had pretty much no friends and it wasn't for the lack of trying. I tried mm -hmm. really hard, but I was also very weird. But yeah. I've learned growing up, especially into adulthood, if you're yourself, you put out a signal, the right people will hear it. And then you develop that's, actual relationships. It's, it's true. strange. It's yeah, strange. no, I mean, I have I have some really amazing and wonderful, dear, truly, truly dear friends but I do think, and I don't know if it came from me moving and feeling like every year I had to say goodbye to people. Like, yeah. having fun. I was never, I just didn't know how to continue that sort of, oh, oh yeah, together this year, what do I do with it? I literally, when I got to college, I freaked out because it was four years with the same people. And when we finished that first year, oh, when yeah. I was no longer a freshman, I was like, bye, have a nice life. And they're like, we're going <laughs> to see you in two months. What are you talking about? Like, I, I didn't know, I didn't know how to create that long form connection and so I wonder if I had grown up in the same place with the same people going through school together if I maybe would have learned some of that just like I want to almost say it's like um mycelium like from mushrooms like how they're all connected yeah totally like I almost like that part of me sort of got stunted somehow Yuri makes fun of me sometimes like we'll run into people and I'll be like, oh, what are you doing here? Because like, I don't expect to see them. I, and I get sort of flustered. And he's like, you know, you can just say, hey, how are you? Like, you don't have to be like, I'm like hyper alert. But my brain almost goes into like fight or flight because I'm surprised by the connection. Right. <laughs> How'd you and find me? Like, yeah, he's like, you know what? It's, it's okay to just be like, hey, how's it going? And ask how they are and see what they're up to. Whereas like, if I send you an email, my email is always like, this is the information you needed. This is what I need from this email. Okay. Yeah. And it's like, why don't you just start Business. with, Hey, how's it going? Or I heard that you bought a dog or like any yeah. kind of human connection. I'm like, Oh, is that what you do? Like, it's almost like I'm an Android trying to pretend to be human, which is ridiculous because I, I do understand the human condition and hum humanity so well as, in, as my work, but as me as a human, I'm lacking. Right. <laughs> it's on paper. It's like scientists yeah. that have yeah. no social skills. It's like they yeah. can land a rocket, yeah. but they can't take you out to lunch. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's hilarious. That's that's a, that's why you're so good at acting. You know, you can't have it all, Tara. You I know, can't be man, both personable. Right? And, you know, I get yeah. it. I understand. <laughs> yeah. well, so you, you mentioned you're getting into acting pretty young. What was it that like, 
started your interest with that because you're moving around a bunch too. So you got yeah. a lot on your mind. So it's funny. So when I was really little, like five or six, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. This was oh. before my dad wanted to switch careers. Wow. And I was like, I want to be a neurosurgeon. He's like, you know what? I've always wanted to be a doctor. Maybe I'll go back to med school. <laughs> so then I watched my dad do med school and I was like, yeah, that's cool. I think I'd rather play a doctor. Yeah. Good point. So when good I point. was about seven or eight, my mom who was a writer and had done some theater when she was younger and oh, cool. had been in some plays when I was growing up, she would take me to plays because my dad was studying all the time and had exams and he sure. couldn't always hang out with us. Um, and so I would go to the theater with my mom and I remember seeing, it was, I think we were seeing the musical Oklahoma. Nice. And uh, it had a cast of kids in the chorus that were like singing and dancing and having a super blast of a time. And I was like, what are they doing? And <laughs> how do you do that? Cause that looks really fun. Yeah. And my mom who had some experience and it was like, yeah, well, you know, you have to audition and then you may or may not get it. And if you get it, then you're going to have to go to rehearsals. You're going to have to learn your lines. You're going to have to do what the director says. You're going to have to uh, show up and do all the performances. You're going to have to like, it's, it's a, it's a very big a investment. Thing. Yeah. It's not just like, cool. I want to do this yeah. thing. And I want all the lights and glory. And I yes. was like, okay, yeah, well, that's fine. She goes, well, if you're interested, you go through the newspaper and you go through, there was like a little wanted section for local plays and theater in Oklahoma, where we were living. And oh. she's like, just go through that. And if you find something that has an audition for a kid, I will take you. And if you get yourself prepared, I will take you. And I was like, oh, cool. cool, I can do that. And like a month later, there was an audition for a play called wait until dark and there was a little girl in the, the cast and it's a it's a theater play it wasn't a musical it was just a straight um stage play no sure. singing involved um but it was a little girl in it she's like i actually know this play i was in this play in college i can tell you about it so we talked Ooh. about it i read the play um and she she ran lines with me and then i i learned a monologue i don't even know what the monologue was now but i learned a monologue <laughs> for the audition and then of course i booked it i yeah. got the job and then I was like, oh, this is magic candy. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I learn this stuff and I do what the director says and it's really fun. And I get all this attention and I hang out with all these adults because it was yeah. also hard for me. I didn't have a lot of friends as kids, but all these adults thought I was amazing. So I was this little kid coming to do this cool thing with them, you know? Right. And I was like, this is awesome. And then I just had a series of, at the time, as a kid, I went from show to show to show to show. And I was like, I love this. This is fantastic. And so around that time, when I was about nine, I was like, this is what I want to do. And so as I continued to move schools, I started to look for theater programs and do that. And in fact, the final high school that I went to, my parents actually got the house that they were going to get based on the school district having a good theater program because they could have kind of moved to anyone in sort of an area. Yeah. And they picked the one that had the best theater district and school, you know, teacher That's in the cool. theater department, which was cool. Cause I'm an only, and they're like, well, they wanted me to be happy since they knew we were moving to another state and we had to be sort of, so we moved to Michigan and that's sort of what I did. And then from there, I went to college and got my BFA um, Dude. in theater arts. That's yeah. intense. Mm -hmm. I, I love that your mom was like real with you at the beginning. You're like, oh, yeah. it looks fun, but also yeah. listen. <laughs> yeah. And then I think my dad always thought that I was going to be like, yeah, plays were fun. Let's get back to science. Yeah. And he, what happened? <laughs> like one day you were going to be full on a doctor. Cause I actually, this was a long time ago, but like he was able to take me. I remember being there and watching him do the dissection of the cadaver as the kid. What? And I was sort of like, oh, cool. So where's the liver? Okay. So what's the pancreas? Like, I remember being there with him yeah. and like, this is when I was like a kid, I would just like go with him. And some of the other doctors were talking about things. I was like, that's because the mitochondria do that. And they were like, they thought it was amazing. So I was like this little kid who was like super into science and stuff. And I was like, well, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. So I just need to know how this all works. And they're right. like, okay. <laughs> and now I'm nothing like any of that. Sure. But I did the life science and math. Like I do, I, I do, I am still a little bit of a nerd for those things. Cause I do love learning. I mean, I do think that is one thing that is true to me as a human is that like, whatever I'm doing, I want to learn about it. I want to find out more. I want to discover it. I want to sort of investigate and research it. Yeah, that makes sense. And that just makes you better at your job as well. Yeah. Just being thorough with your thing. Yeah. 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 I'm into that. What yeah. was stage always the goal then? You know, I don't think so. It was sort of my gateway drug. Yeah. Um, there you it go. was, it was me getting into it and really loving it. And I really do love stage, but I think 
when I got a little older, now I also grew up with no television. So we would go see a movie oh. once a week. So I never had a television growing up. So I never watched TV shows. So to me, when I was thinking about it, I was like, well, I'll work on stage and I'll do features. Like I'll be in big movies. Like I sure. would be Julia Roberts. That was of kind course. of like the, the thing. And it was so funny. <laughs> I have friends who are like, oh, I would only ever want to have the path of a Meryl Streep. And I was like, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I want to be Julia Roberts or... Yes. Like yes. I, I, I want to have a different career. I don't want to be Meryl Streep. She does all these sad things. Not that I couldn't yeah. perform them, but I was like, I don't want to choose between which child lives. Like that is sure. not a game that I want to play at all. I was like, I want to be Sandra Bullock. Um, yes. So yes. like, that's what I want. Um, so I think for me as a kid and getting further into it, it was always going to be, I was going to do stage and then I was going to do movies. Yeah. And so, but at the time there wasn't like how to major in just film. Of <laughs> like, that wasn't really a thing. So like <laughs> I got my BFA, I did a lot of theater as a kid growing up. And then when I went to college, that's when I started to discover, oh, there's television too and mm -hmm. film. But I think I was always just sort of predisposed in my mind to film because that's what I had seen and what I had experienced so much of. Right. And I knew the evocative power of watching a movie and having the catharsis of feeling the character's emotions because they yes. affect me. And like, I really connected with that because not only was it what I did every week, I would go to the dark church that is the cinema and watch something. Yes. But I, I also like, I, I just, I really connected with that. And and then when I got out of college, I was like, well, I still love theater and I'm still going to go that route because I knew how to do theater. It, has, it was what I was trained to do. Right. But I was always looking for the, how do I get into the film? How do I get into the film? How do I make that happen? And of course, when you're in New York at the time, I was in New York, mm -hmm. um, to get into film is also to try to get into television because it's a yep. similar sort of casting. Yeah. And so I booked... Um, a couple soap operas and things of that nature before having an agent see me in a play who wanted me to come out to Los Angeles. So then wow. I was like, oh, this is it. I haven't made an agent in Los Angeles wants me to come out there. This is great. And that's how I married Yuri. Cause I uh -huh. was like, I have to drive across country. He's like, well, I'll go with you. So you don't have to drive across country. And we eloped and we hit, got married in Vegas. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Uh, but then we were out in Los Angeles and both of us were like, now what do we do? And luckily <laughs> I had an agent, but you know, I'm 23 in Los Angeles and I'm new here and it's a little overwhelming and I don't have a lot of experience. And I, I just kind of, I, I think I, I didn't know what to do. And I was like, well, what are other things that we can do to make money while we occasionally are booking things, which was great, but like, it doesn't pay the rent if you have one booking every once in a blue moon. And yeah, so you're like, sure. what do I do? And it was funny that I was the one that was actually like, hey, what is that thing that people do for like cartoons? And Yuri's like, are you kidding me? Voiceover? And I was like, yeah, don't people do stuff for like, <laughs> I don't know, cartoons and and he's like, and video games and stuff. And I was like, yeah, let's take a class. Because once again, I go back to my, let's take a class if I don't sure. know how to work. <laughs> and so we took the class and then he booked work right away. And then I got a voiceover agent right away. And then we started both of us booking work in voiceover. Get it while we still continue to pursue on camera. But yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know that I specifically was like, I want to do stage, except that it was what I knew. And then we were both of us doing stage out here for a long time. And then I think part of it was that once we started to get serious about, oh, are we're gonna, if we're gonna have a kid now is when we're gonna do it. Right. <laughs> now I'm not gonna be doing theater because I'm tired all the time. Yeah. And I want to You want to, to see them? <laughs> yeah. And I want to go to bed when my child goes to sleep because it's the only time I can sleep. Yeah, um, so smart. I don't know when I will get back on stage, but I've also realized that I really love film. Like I just really love Same. film. And same. That's one of the reasons I think that we started our own production company is because we can still be creating the things we care about. And so like we have a couple of films in Slate that like we are going to be making at some point. And so I'm oh, like, yeah. if I if I never get back on stage as much as I love theater and as much as it's what propelled me to where I am now, I will survive. And I've had some amazing experiences on stage. Like the fact that I got to be Juliet at the Pasadena Civic directed by John DeLancey was lovely. Dude. Like I have some really juicy tidbits from some of the work that I got to do on stage that will always be with me. And it's funny because sometimes people are like, well, what's the one role you would really love to play? And I'm like, 
any role is the role that you really love to play when you get the chance to play it because you yes. get to dive in and dissect it. But just like looking through the oeuvre of like any role that's out there in the world, I'm like, I don't know. It's not like I was going through my life and I'm like, I have to play Cleopatra before I die. Sure. Like, <laughs> it'd be cool to play Cleopatra, but it's not like that's, you know what I mean? Like there's, yes. I'm not walking around with a list of titles in the back of my head where I'm like, oh, I need to check off my, you know, my, uh, you know, like I, I don't need these playwrights checked off on my, my cue card. And so there's a part of me that's like, if I never were to step back out on stage, would I be okay? And I think I would because I have this other outlet now because I'm creating my totally. own projects and I can do it in a different way. And you know, but, but it's interesting. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, if I had told my 20 year old self that I may at some point never go back on stage again, which is not necessarily true. I may show up on stage next year. Who knows? Sure, sure. But like, if I told my 20 year old <laughs> self that I would probably be like, I don't know who you are. Kill the alien imposter that took over. Yeah. My <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, did you find, cause I know you worked on, uh, like days of our lives and young and the yeah. restless and I'm fascinated by soap operas because it's such a quick turnaround. Oh and yeah. You, you gotta be like, I mean, I bet type A really came in handy. So yeah, well, I mean, like you said, it's really fast turnaround and you have to just be willing to roll with the punches. Yeah. Um, I was never like a series regular or anything, but I did work with a lot of people that were and watching mm -hmm. them just like power through the dialogue and like pick it up, figure it out, get on with it and move on was amazing oh. because you just kind of in a way don't have time to think about your choices. Sure which ironically is kind of like voiceover. You don't really have time to think about your choices. You kind of just make your choice and then do it. Interesting. Um, whereas I think sometimes with work on stage, because you have this nice, juicy, lugubrious rehearsal period, if you're working with a nice director that actually has time to right. let you <laughs> do that, like you really you sometimes can overthink it because you're considering the entire arc of the whole play and you, you know, you, you know where you need to get people by the third act. So you're trying to carve out the beats and the moments in the first act and how that's going to look and, you know, what's more compelling, you know, all these choices that you can over sort of work it a little bit. You sure. can. I mean, anyone can overwork anything. You can chew the scenery doing voiceover as well. <laughs> like totally. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't mean to say that like there's a, but, but I will say that with soap work in particular, you kind of just got to do it and be present and open to letting the emotions go through your system as quickly and as easily and fluidly as possible. Sure. And you also can't push it because also you know, you just want it to be very like honest and truthful because the camera is up your nostril and you're yeah. <laughs> move on with it. you know, like you gotta just be like super tiny, but that goes to the the point of like, they're all acting, whatever medium right. you're doing it in, absolutely, what's going to change it. And it's going to affect the size of it and sometimes how you get to it. But at the root of it, you're still you're still acting. So whether you're doing voiceover and you get to say the line three different times and three different ways, and then move on to the next line and do the same thing again. Yep. Or if you're doing a play where you're rehearsing it for three weeks and then going up and doing the whole of the arc of that piece, or if you're doing a soap where you have 20 pages of dialogue that you have to memorize and then get on with it, you know, <sighs> like you're, you're still acting. It's just it's sort of how you, how big you make your vessel and where you put your attention and how you make your choices and how you're the detective and investigate the script and what you can glean from it. And then how quickly you can just move to the next thing and get onto it. Sure. Um, I think that's kind of, I don't know. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I didn't even know if I had a question. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was like, did I just... I, that I makes know. sense, though, because it, it is like it's a medium. It's like how big is the lens? Is the lens yeah. the audience in a in a room full of people versus a microphone? Like, yeah. what, was there a learning curve to be able to growing up in learning stage to go from film yeah. and then voiceover? Um, I think the only part of the learning curve for me with voiceover in particular, because I took a class, of course, of course, and it was really learning in the class about the different types of voiceover. So like, oh, there's commercial and there's animation right. and there's narration and there's like learning that was the biggest key for me and a little bit of mic technique. Mm -hmm. Oh, if I, if I stay on mic this way, I can be this close to it and then that'll affect my quality but there wasn't really anything in the class that changed the acting part of it for me. That part was already my inherent 
what I had already learned to that point, either just maybe it was some natural skills, but also all the training I had had. And so I think for me, the big learning was how to work the microphone specifically as like a technical, yeah. <laughs> like, what do I do with this strange thing poking me in the face? Sure. And then also sort of understanding, oh, when I'm doing a commercial, the more I can be talking to one person and bringing the, the copy alive that really highlights the name of the product so that the person who's trying to sell it, the ad man's happy, you know, how do I do that versus when I get to do a video game or a cartoon with some sort of animated character, how can I just jump in and make fast choices about who the character is and what they may sound like so that then I've made a strong choice that then can be directable. Gotcha. That makes sense. Setting the goalposts so far that you have room to play and learn. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Seeing, I'm seeing the thread here. Yeah. Do you remember your first voiceover gig? Yes. What was it? It was a video game. Oh, okay. And okay. Um, <laughs> uh, it was directed by someone who's now a dear friend of mine, but at the time, like, I didn't know anybody. Uh -huh. And uh, I had gotten the video game and I didn't really know what I was doing because I was like, oh my of God, course. I booked a thing. What do I do? Right. <laughs> and I showed up and it was, it was a non-union project. This was like 1 million years ago. Sure. And at the time, I also, I didn't even know like that, sessions are usually booked in two or four hour increments. Like I didn't, I didn't even have that information. Oh. I, just, I didn't even know. And I showed <laughs> up and they were like, you're booked at one o'clock or whatever the time was. Mm -hmm. And I think at the time Yuri and I were sharing a car because I needed him to come pick me up. That's what it is. Perfect. I needed him to come pick me up when I was done, but I didn't know when I was going to be done. And, and I think I vaguely asked when I was going to be, when they thought that I'd be done just so I could let my husband know when to come pick me up. And they're like, Oh, it should take a couple hours. And so I was like, Hey, it'll be a couple hours, but I call, I'll call you. Uh, if I have a break, if I have any information, I was there for seven hours. <gasps> oh, no. oh my God. I thought I was going to die. I was so tired. I also don't think I had eaten or I don't think, I think they had like peanuts in the break room, but I also, it was, it was also really disconcerting because they had so much more dialogue than I think they even thought that they had. And sure. I felt really bad later talking to my friend who was the director. It was also a lot being dropped on her and she didn't realize what was gonna be happening or what was going on right and so like she was a little out of her element too and she was just trying to power through and she didn't know that I was new to the like she assumed I'd been doing it for a while so like yeah. there was there was a lot of like <laughs> you know and I was by myself in this little soundproof room with like a window glass that like I could only hear when they would push talk back and I was like they hate me I don't know what's <laughs> going on why is it taking so long and like it just it was miserable and I remember leaving that session and like getting in the car with Yuri and like bursting into tears and being like oh my god I never want to do this again this is awful I it terrible I didn't even want to tell them I had to go to the bathroom because I didn't know what I was taking so long and it was just like it was just a terrible miserable experience but now I can laugh on it and be like oh my god I I should have made some key things I should have I should have seen what the line count was or tried to get a little more information about that rather than asking how long I would be there I should have, like there were some things that I could have done but also I feel bad for my friend who was directing it because she was getting a lot of stuff dropped on her and the producers were very taxing which I wasn't privy to because that wasn't the part of the room that I was in. And so, yes, I remember my first job. Oh, man. And you kept doing it. I kept doing it because <laughs> I'm a glutton for punishment. That's right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. And it'd be in a video game. I, so you've done like a ton of stuff, like, mm -hmm. it, w like video games to animation to all that stuff. How much of your life is efforts? Ooh. Uh, well, nowadays, not so much, which is actually kind of nice. Okay. But okay. I would say, I would say I tend to work, I would say 70% in video games and then 30% mm -hmm. in other stuff, which could be original animation or now animation. Although there used to be a time when there was more animation, animated right. specifically, yeah. but I'm doing, I'm doing less of that now, partly because there's less of it because <clears throat> they're, they're sort of outsourcing it. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, and occasionally I do, I do commercials and sometimes I do books on tape and uh, promos and things like that. But I would say for me, I'm about a 70, 30 actor where 70% of my stuff is video games oh, and 30% cool. makes up the rest of it. And 
I will say there are plenty of efforts involved in that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's just me being who I am or me auditioning for different kinds of roles now, but like I used to always audition for like the soldier driving through the thing and have, you'd have to do like all the stuff. Sure. And now sometimes when I read the script, I'm like, oh, I want to audition for the scientist. And it's not <laughs> that a scientist won't have efforts, but <laughs> sure. you know, if you're playing the soldier, you know, you're going to have the efforts. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I, I've done my fair share of efforts. I don't think I'm as good at efforts as Yuri is, but I credit his, his Kung Fu martial arts background. Cause he learned how to do all the, hoo, ha, hoo, you know, right. He's got that whereas, key eye down pat. Yeah, exactly. Whereas I was like, you do what? Wait, yeah. what is that sound? <laughs> um, no. Like power Rangers. Yeah. Okay, but I never right. watched power Rangers. So that doesn't mean oh, anything. Right. <laughs> you have no but I know what reference. you mean just from understanding the world, but I never watched it. So. That's right. The Power Rangers is your Hindenburg. I understand. Yeah, I they get all it. Are. Yeah. All, any TV show is my Hindenburg. <laughs> Everyone's like, did you watch the Friends reunion? I'm like, who's friends? Right. Oh, oh. I know okay. what happened. Yeah. Okay. In theory. <laughs> right. So there were some people who lived in New York. Yeah, I lived in New York. That's cool. <laughs> sure. That's a real place. Can attest. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, you've done a bunch of dubbing too. Does, does that get easier over time? Because that's a specific skill. Yeah, I mean, yes. I think there's a learning curve with dubbing where you're trying I to bet. figure out the beats and the timing and like how to do it. And then I do think you sort of, I mean, maybe some people are always learning it, but I think you sort of get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm proficient at this, you know? Sure. Um, so like, like I do think that I got better at it. And then I think I'm at a fairly like professional skill of doing that. Totally. Um, and I've noticed that it can be very helpful when I've had to do ADR for uh, film and television because I come in and they're like, well, you're done with your ADR now. <laughs> I'm like, OK, cool. And they're like, uh, so we're done an hour and a half early. Everybody want to go to lunch? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you guys thought it was going to take me a lot longer. OK, cool. Right. So like, obviously, I guess I, I must have picked up a thing or two doing the dubbing. But yeah, it's 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 a little bit of like patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time. If you can if you can kind of get the whole, oh, the beeps are going to go. And then I have to come in where the third imaginary beep is and watch the mouth flap to try to keep it the right length of time. Right. Once you can start to navigate what that feels like, then you can start to sort of code it with the emotional arc of what you're trying to do and do all of that at the same time until you're riding the bicycle sort of effortlessly. Gotcha. I, you know, that's something that I love about acting is the fact that it's a craft. Like yeah. There, there's, there is a technicality to it. Yeah. That people forget about that I think is really important. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But I do think it's funny when you look at um, many jobs, many, many professions are paid not necessarily equivalent to what the, the skills required are, but like sure. th there's sort of a, a scale of like, oh, this is a difficult thing or you have to go to school for four years to master this before you can do it. So I'm going to start charging at a higher rate than like anyone on the street can do this. So, you know, like there is that sort of idea. And it's so funny to me in voiceover because dubbing, which takes these very specific technical skills, right? You have to match the timing and be yep. in the right, you know, like all of that. And you're doing it to someone else's performance where you're trying to take key elements of that performance, make it your own and still perform it while fitting all that, the other technical mumbo jumbo into the right timing right. Is, the, is the least paid of all. Yeah. Of <laughs> like you've got dubbing at the bottom yep. and then there's sort of like, some commercials, depending on, you know, like you just show up, you do the, the, to radio spot only. And then there's like books on tape, which is like, you get a word count per hour. Cause you're reading a certain thing. And then it moves up into like original animation and video games. Like you're getting much more money for certain things. And I'm like, it's so much easier to do original <laughs> animation when you show up and play a character that you create. Yes. <laughs> Yes. But, you know, it's just funny. It's always been funny to me that the, the hierarchy uh, financially is, is in a certain order. Whereas what the, what your compensation, your commensurate yeah. compensation is. That's so wild. Yeah. I love stuff like that. I also love like connections and especially with like, you've played someone named Yuri in Spider-Man, mm -hmm. which I just mm -hmm. think is great, but even yeah. greater than that, how did you guys swing the Hawaii five Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Because that was right. the best. Okay. okay. So, um, you know, I told you we were still pursuing television and film yes. even while we were doing voiceover. And we, I think, made a very smart choice. At the time, we didn't know that many married couples that mm -hmm. were sort of pursuing it 
being out about the fact that they were married. So we would go, we would, we were going to casting director workshops. And when we would meet people, we would try to send out postcards and we always included ourselves on the postcards with each other. And we would be like, you know, we're We're a package deal. Yeah. We're like, not that anyone has to hire both of us, Sure. but like, Hey, that would be fun. And it would help our bank account. So like we're down the two of us. We're good for that. Um, and I forget we had auditioned for the casting director of Hawaii Five-O both separately at points in time. Cool. Um, and it hadn't, it hadn't worked. We hadn't booked those jobs. Mm-hmm. And then I guess she saw this was coming up and she's like, oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> I could bring them in for this. And we still auditioned for it, but I think it was one of those things where she, she already sort of knew us and she's like, how comfortable would you guys be? You guys are going to have to be a little, you know, it's going to be kind of, <laughs> a little close and we were like are you kidding me and it was one of the best gigs ever because I will tell you what they did for that episode because of the way they were shooting it um oftentimes with television and episodic you will shoot for a whole week the whole episode will take about a week to shoot right um and they'll sort of like wrap out people that they need to do certain things but they had us there and we had to shoot on day one of the episode and then our oh. last scene was on day eight so they flew us to Hawaii. <laughs> to shoot this episode that we got to be in together where we had seven days between shooting while we were in Hawaii. What? <laughs> Which was crazy. And Dude. then the worst part was poor Yuri got a sinus infection. So he was like, oh, no. miserably sick. And I was like, <laughs> it's in Hawaii. It's beautiful. You want to go for a drive? And he's like, I don't feel good. And I'm like, no. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? His eyes uh, all puffy. So are we in Hawaii? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but we had a great time working on that. That was, that was super fun. And I mean, anytime I love him so much and I think he's so talented that anytime we get a chance to work together, it's just, it's just a joy, but it's especially fun um, getting to do it and have people see it or have people know that we got to play together, you know, yes. like so, so things like Hawaii Five-0 were really fun. Because oftentimes, even with voiceover, we'll work on the same project, but we're not working together. If you know sure. what I mean. Yeah, he goes in for that particular job and works on Tuesday. And then a week later on Thursday, I go in for my session. So right. we work together without ever really working together. And so that was very, very fun to get to do. I bet. that It was funny when I was looking at a bunch of stuff that you've done. I've, I've been on a Tara Platt marathon for like a month. <laughs> it, it's been fantastic. Awesome. And that, that specific clip, I was like, wait, that's Yuri. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, well, that's also why they thought, because they were like, oh, this will be easy. They'll be comfortable doing the stuff. Um, yeah. It's so, so funny. You yeah, did that. that. You did. I know you did an episode of Castle. I've yeah. seen every episode of that was great. Yes. yes. And speaking of I'm really glad you brought up Monkey Kingdom Productions because I have seen almost all of it. Really? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how proud of the stuff that we create we are and how sad I am that no one in the world has seen it. So thank you for being our audience. I'm going to tell you right now. I've seen all the seasons of Shelf Life. I've seen Out of Time, Topsy McGee. I bought Con Artists. You did? I did. I've seen What a Lark. I'm yes! telling you, I watched your TED talk, Tara. <gasps> listen, oh man, I I was I was going to beg you to hang out with me. I'm glad I didn't have to. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do, wait, do I, I have to beg you to hang out with me? Because now you've seen all that stuff. So are you still yes, gonna? Hang yes, yes. Yuri sent me a check um, oh, okay, before okay, this. Just, okay, yeah. as long as we're clear. As long of course, as we're, there we're, has to be a give and take. You understand. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's show well, business. How much is your time valuable? Yeah. I, mean, I have to, uh, have to pay for all that time that we took from you. Yeah, it's currently valued at worthless. But awesome. um, <laughs> did you watch our travel show? Did you watch Up, Up, and Away? I, did you go travel? With I us? have seen every episode of Up, Up, and Away. Yay. I, I watched that before even Yuri came on. I love traveling as well. Aww. And when I saw how much you love elephants, I also love elephants. You do? I do. I do. They're my second favorite animal. What's your first favorite animal? I like rhinos. <gasps> fascinating so growing up I was like all elephant I'm like all in on elephant yes Um, uh and that was like my life in fact I was the person who would get gifted elephant stuffed animals and elephant photos and elephant t-shirts and elephant everything I've seen a mug in what a lark I've seen millions of elephants right have all the elephants well as I got older I still love elephants don't get me wrong elephants are my like they're my jam of course I realize I realize I also really like octopuses 
Ooh, um, they're that's really a good one. smart. And I had this, I had this experience with an octopus at, a uh, at an aquarium. What? And Talk to me. What happened? I, I just, we were in this aquarium and I turned my head and this octopus was like, sort of, you know how they sort of like skitter crawl across surfaces. Yes. And so it was like skitter crawling across the surface toward me on the glass wall. Um, we were up at the Santa Barbara Aquarium and I was like, Ooh, that's such a beautiful, like it just, the color, it was just beautiful. And it caught my eye and I walked over to it. And as soon as I got in front of it, it started changing color what? and I put my hand, like, I didn't mean to, but like, I was just like transfixed. And I put my hand on the glass and it put its suckers where my fingers were. Like it put one little hand where each finger was against the glass yeah and I started to move my hand and it started to move with me and I was like what? we're having a moment yeah. oh my god <laughs> and so like I just I just fell in love with this octopus and I was like oh my god Yuri I love I love this octopus like I just I just I'm in love with him he's yes. just amazing like I just I had this connection and um at the time like you know this is probably about 10 years ago. I mm -hmm. used to eat things like calamari and stuff like that, which are squid. I'm just going to yep, be really yeah. clear about that. <laughs> but I was like, I don't think I can ever, I don't think I can do this again. And Yuri used to live in Japan. Yep. I know you already talked to him, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, um, whatever. So he cares? used to eat, uh, I think it's called a takiyaki. I'm oh not yeah. But, but I was like, Yuri, we, we can't, I'm sorry. I, I have to lay down the law. We, we can't, eat octopus like ever again and he's yep. like okay <laughs> okay <laughs> but like ever since then I just was like okay octopus is too so now if you come to my house there's like an octopus teapot who like it's beautiful because like the arm comes around and that's the handle and then like so there's octopuses in my house too it's not just elephants I like that a lot when I learned that they could change colors I was like what is this creature oh it was amazing, but it was like he was talking to me because there weren't really other people around that section when we were there. Yeah. And it was like, he reached out to me and I was like, Hey, what's going on? And I went over to the glass and he was like, Hey, like he put his hand up and I was like, hi, like we just, it was, I've never had a creature at a zoo or an aquarium or something like that feel like it was really like making contact with me yeah. and since then I've done extensive research on the intelligence of octopus and oh I'm yeah like this is amazing super yeah. smart yeah super smart I yeah. uh, my wife and I talked a, a while ago we're like maybe we should get an aquarium and then one of the things you oh, find when, when you start deep diving aquariums one don't do it super expensive yes also no. if you ever get yeah. an octopus it's gonna get out and I was like, what? Can you imagine? Yeah, because they're smart. <laughs> and they're like, why did you put me in the aquarium? That's right. I, I don't need thumbs. I, I have eight of these. I know. I know. But my dream is to have like an octopus for a pet that just like hangs out with me. Like, you know, he rides on my shoulder and then can like yes. go into his pool when he wants to. Perfect. You know, whatever. You I mean, bottle. I'm totally normal. It's yeah. fine. It's fine. Yeah. Hey, I support this. I will be next to you with the spritz bottle. <laughs> just making sure he's comfortable. Okay, I'm, cool. I'm there. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I'm there. I'm there. I also love there's a thing that you've said in the past a bunch where you talk about excellence through play and having mm -hmm. watched almost all of your things and having thoroughly enjoyed all of your things <laughs> that comes okay. through everything you've done, like gen genuinely all oh, that makes me so happy. I wanted to say that Yay. to you because it's everything you do. Even do you still have the, the shelf life action figures? Yes. Oh, cool. Thank God. They're was, literally staring at me while I'm doing this interview. They're up on the top of Yuri's shelf and I'm sitting yes. in his office on the couch. That makes me so happy. Yeah. <laughs> Judgingly. Talking about it. Right? They're judging <laughs> me. They're bug boy is like looking at me like he's going to jump on my head. Yeah. yeah. They're judging me. <laughs> I'm not going to say that I really enjoyed the uh, multiple seasons and then the costume changes. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. I like this. But every oh, time I see a Sharpie, yeah. I think of Hero Last. So thanks for that. I know, right? Hero Last. Poor Hero Last. Yeah, you know, yes. she was great. She was great. And the, it was the things that you do also with all these projects with Monkey Kingdom is like, you're so creative and like using shelf life as an example. You're on the shelf that is established. This is where this takes place. But then you have like, now we're in a suitcase. Now we're under the bed. I'm like, I never would have thought of that. It's so smart. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, well, I'm stuff. so glad that you enjoy it. Like I said, we're so proud of these things. And you should be. It does make me a little sad that I feel like we're very good at creating mm -hmm. and making things. And I think that's really important. I think finishing is one of the most important things you can oh, do my God, yes. as a creative. 
So if you're going to write a book, finish it. If you're going to make a show, finish it. Like, I feel like there's so many people in process yes. and it's not that being in process is a bad thing, but if you never complete something, you never, it goes back to learning. You never learn from what you've done. Cause you have to be able to close the book in order to learn from it. And um, for me, it's all about like complete it, complete it, complete it. And that whole adage of like, um, done is good enough kind of it's not that I don't want people to try to perfect things and like I say like even the quote we were talking about excellence in play so I'm trying I'm striving for excellence in everything I do and I'm giving it my best but my best from 10 years ago is going to be different than my best from now and if you don't ever if you don't ever finish it then you never get the chance to push yourself now. And so you have to finish and you have to complete so you can be striving for even perfection if that's what you're into. Although I think perfection is a, is a very yeah. vastly over, like I, I'm not, that's not my, I'm not a perfectionist. That's not my jam at all. Same. I am, I'm an excellencist. If yeah. that's, if that's <laughs> worth it. Like give it your best, do 110%, make it as good as you can right now, but done is good enough. So that that way, then you can move forward and push yourself to the next thing. Because I would never have made Wada had I not made Shelf Life, and I never would have made, like you don't you don't oh, yeah. create the things you do create without having created the things you did. And so, like I'm just so immensely proud of everything we've done, both in books, but also you know in films and 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 series. And I wish that we were better. And, and maybe this goes back to what our whole conversation at the beginning was about, like me learning how to connect to people. Like, I wish that I were better at distribution and sort of pushing our material so that more people could see it. Cause we don't just create it for ourselves as much as we're like sure. proud of what we do, enjoying <laughs> it and like happy with it. I really wish that we could find our audience and totally. find the people that are going to light up because of the content that we made, because those people are out there. Like you were saying, I'm earlier, right I forget your phrase, but you said something about like, you put yourself out there and the right people will find it. Yes. I'm just, it's, it's, it's really hard because there's millions of people out there and it's hard to sift through all the stuff. And so it's like, yes, I believe that, that the right people can find it, but you sometimes have to have enough of a push behind you for those people to be able to find it. Absolutely. I wish wish that was something that both Yuri and I were more skilled at because we're actually, I mean, I know this is a podcast, so people are going to hear about it, but I'm working to try to do the feature of What a Lark right now. And it's going to be the first time that I have to actually raise like investment funds because it's going to cost several million dollars to do this as like a big movie. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm scared shitless because I've never done, like, I've always been like, oh, we have two quarters and some costumes under the bed, guys. Let's go make this. Like, and I'm proud of what we've done with what we've been able to do. But like, if I'm trying to up level to the next level and push myself, I have to do that. Yeah. And that's not just a crowdfunding thing because I don't have enough of a rabid following group that'll just give me $2 million to make the movie. So I have to actually yes. find investors to do this. Yeah. And I'm terrified <laughs> because I've never done that before. Because of course, we're always scared of the unknown. Of course. But it's also that idea of like, how do you get those right people to find you? How do you, how do you find the audience? How do you market to the people that will light up when your stuff makes them light up, you know? So yeah. thank you again so much for your kind words. I really does mean a lot. And I appreciate that. Of course. I also find, especially recently, I've really connected with like creators as opposed to consumers. Mm-hmm. Cause it, there's something mm-hmm. that happens in your brain when you go from, I watch things versus I make things. It's like, oh, yeah. we, we have the same scars. You know, mm-hmm, from like, mm-hmm. oh, making the things like are, was was being able to like let go of something at the end, be like, this is my best right now. Is that something you had to learn or is that something that you just did? Because that's really hard. I, I think that's something I just did. Yeah, Um. I think I think it might be a little of the the autodidact in me, the person who is always striving to learn. Sure. I think because it's almost like, okay, I finished reading that book. Now I want to read the next book. I'm not someone who wants to go back and read the same book over again. Totally. Um, it's something actually Yuri and I disagree with a little bit. Like he'll want to rewatch the same movie if he likes it over again to see what about it he liked. And he'll want to watch it again if he didn't like it to see why he didn't like it. Sure. And I think that's actually what makes him a great writer because he's learning while he's doing it. Yes. Whereas I'm like, there's only so much time. There's eight <laughs> billion things in the world. I, I did this one. I got to move on to the next one, man. Right. And so I think there's a little part of that. And maybe it's anxiety that helps drive me to like, okay, we did that. What are all the other mountains I'm trying to climb? Cause I did Kilimanjaro. So what is next? Yeah. You know, like I think, I think that's just, that's just part of who I am inherently. 
is this need to do as much as I can and see as much as I can and experience as much as I can yes. in a short, short, tiny little window of time that Tara Platt gets to be, you know, yeah. like I, I just, I, my, my clock's ticking. Yeah. And I mean that like as a human being, uh -huh. <laughs> like I'm done with the whole mom thing, although I love my child and yeah. I'm happy to, you know, <laughs> care for my progeny for the rest. But I, I don't mean that kind of clock. I just mean like, I only get such a short blip of time Yes. to be on this gorgeous, amazing, wonderful, awe-inspiring world. I want to do as much as I can and be everything that I can in that time. And so I think I'm not precious because it is precious, if that makes sense. Sure. No, that makes total sense. We're, we're made of the same stuff. I feel the exact same way. Like life is so full of possibilities that it's almost a disservice to not experience as much as you possibly can. Yeah. And, but because of that, I think that's what drives me to be like, okay, this is good. Let's move on to the next one. So that like, let's complete it and, and finish it out so that we can do the next one because you never get to move on to the next one. If you're so focused on the rose in front of you, which is amazing and glorious and beautiful and smells good, you miss the entire garden and you miss the sequoias and you miss that, like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be with that rose fully and then move on. <laughs> like, sure. I think that's just, I think that's just who I am, like inside of me. Although obviously it's not like, I'm like, Hey, Yuri, that was nice. Peace out. Like, I mean, there are things <laughs> that, you, that you invest in and you spend your time with, but like, as far as projects and creation for me, I think it's very much like, cool. I did that. Let's, let's close that chapter and move on because then I can, I can review it as I keep going. Right. I admire that so much because it it's hard to, to yeah. be able to do that's a really important skill to have to be able yeah. to let go of it. Cause yeah, finish not perfect kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I, I really think, I think done is the enemy. I mean, perfect is the enemy of done. Like yeah, there's this I idea so. that like when you're trying to hone it and trying to perfect it, if you saw the Ted talk, you know I that I was working on, you saw that, you, you know, that I was working on a YA novel, right? Yep. Yep. Um, when we did the Ted talk and, and then I kind of like dwindled a little bit and I was like, I don't know what to do. Well, I finally got an editor and I started working on it again. And Hell so yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm nearing completion with that. But you know, there are times when we don't have the energy or the stamina or the drive to complete something right then. Of course. And that's when you have to just sort of set it down and leave it for a little while and then focus your attention on other things. So for me, the pandemic helped because I focused <laughs> on the pandemic and getting through the pandemic. And then like, you know, a couple of months ago, I was like, oh, we're actually going to come out of this sometime. Oh, right. What were all the list of the things I wanted to achieve? <laughs> oh, right. My novel. I want to get that done. <laughs> I got to finish yes. this. So let me, let me get my editor at it let's like finish this but um it's this idea that like you if you're so so busy making every word right and every corner polished and everything perfect you you miss the opportunity to be flawed and that's where the learning and the growth comes from so like if you think about the Japanese, I think it's called wabi sabi, where things are brokenly, like they're imperfect, they're they're yes. perfect in their imperfections. Mm -hmm. You you miss that opportunity to be like, yeah, you know what? I go back and I look at shelf life and it is not perfect. There are things that I'm like, ugh, you know, that didn't work. But I'm also <laughs> like, it's perfect for what it was when it was and yes. how we created it. And I'm still proud of it. Like Good. I can still find pride and and joy in what I created looking back on it you know, five years, 10 years, whatever later I can go, Oh yeah, I did that. I achieved that. Like when we wrote our book on voiceover, yeah. we did a 10th, a 10th anniversary, but we looked back at the first one. I'm like, this was really good. You know, like yeah. I was like, <laughs> cool. Like it's not perfect. There's even typos in it, you know, but sure. I'm like, but, but even with that, it's still really good. Cause it goes back to like, do the excellent part that you can and then improve on that the next time, <laughs> like yes. take your excellence to the next level, but it's never about it being perfect because perfect is never done. And done is what you're striving for. Cause then that's where the learning comes from. That's where the growth comes from. And then I think being a completionist also shows people that you mean it. Like it shows people yeah. that you actually are committed because everyone has a novel in their head that they're writing their yep. whole life. Of course. And 99.99999% of people 
never actually write that novel. Mm-hmm. It's the point zero 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 one percent of people that do it. Everyone's like, oh my God, they wrote a novel. How could they have done that? But if everybody sat down and wrote a paragraph a day, you would have a novel. It's just nobody's doing that. And so it's the completionist that shows people that you really are serious and that you mean it. And it's it's like an artistic commitment to yourself, but also to the world that you that you're taking up the mantle of getting this one pure life that you get and you're, you're using it fully. Yes. And I also love that you're multifaceted. Like you have travel shows, like you wrote books, which I will <laughs> say I got the audio book for voiceover voice oh, actor awesome. because I was awesome. like, you guys are reading it. I'm getting that one, please. Sweet. And then, Sweet. yeah, you already wrote it. And then you're like, how about we update it? You didn't have to do that, but you did. That's true. And that's really yeah. cool. Thank you. It's great. It's great. It's a great resource as well. With, I mean, I was telling Yuri, I, I put it up there with I want to be a voice actor.com. Like it's so mm-hmm. practical and it's so oh, thank like, you. yeah, D's, that, yeah, D's website is amazing. Oh, it's it's voiceover school, you know, yeah. and I, I recommend your book to everyone because I'm like, it's oh, it's you. practical. It's not this like, you know, uh, be your best self and then you'll succeed type of things. You're like also six to eight seconds per clip in this type of demo. You like really yeah. write the math out. And I was like, that's what people need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, cause it's also like, it's not just about sugarcoating things. Like I know I tend to get very like, Oh, this is great. And I'm so excited and it's amazing, but also people just need the data. Like absolutely. How, what, what, what do I actually, what's really going to change this for me? What's going to affect this for me? And where can I learn? It's what I was saying earlier. Like the one thing I wish I had known was like, how to people better. Like sure. that connectivity. <laughs> I'm like, that would be sort of what I would tell people now. I'd be like, just like, obviously push yourself, get your demo together, do all that stuff, but also yep. people <laughs> like just yes. people at a better like level. Yes. Be a good person. <laughs> Actually yeah. live your life. That That's something I, I, when I, when I ask someone to come on the show, a big thing for me is if they're just an actor, I'm not interested because yeah. you're a human being, you have facets. Like I want to know someone who is an actor now, but they actually were like in investment banking before. I'm like, what? Totally. How does yeah. that like, come talk to me, please. How does that work? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's nuts. So as someone who's completed a bunch of stuff and like, it seems like you do your thing, which I really, really like. Cause it comes through the work. Do you have any other advice for like creatives that are looking for a way to funnel it? Hmm. Well, I mean, I do think it goes back to a little like do the thing that makes you happy because you're never going to please someone else. So it's not about like, Oh, well, everybody's into sneakers right now. Let's do something about sneakers. Sure. Like it's, it's not about trying to cater to other people or cater to the masses. It's about figuring out like what your jam is and then spreading that jam around and being like, Hey, does anyone else interested in this jam? And it's not that you can't, you can't sprinkle some sneakers on top of it, but like you want to, you want to try to figure out what lights you up. And so like, for me, that whole excellence in play Mm -hmm. also is part of mine, but for me, it's also about the aesthetic. So I, I'm very much about world building and really having a very fleshed out, visually interesting place. So like Topsy is steampunk and shelf life is high, uh, action figure comic, you know, pop, aesthetic and like it for me the things I create and the things I work on are very much about an aesthetic um not just like from a visual artist element but from like a world building quality sure so so for me it's all about the world so like when I wrote Zartana it was about okay what is this world like for this traveling Romani girl and what does it look like and how does it feel Mm -hmm. and then you know, like, how do I, how do I jump into that world and play for a little while there? Cause I'm interested in it. Not because anyone else is interested in it. Not because anyone else cares, not because anyone asked me to do it, but because I think it's cool. And then what can I do in that world? Where, where are the fun stories? Where is there interesting, something interesting to me? And then how can I best tell that? And how do I, how do I explore that? So for example, with what a lark, when um, even before I was pregnant and we were considering it, I was like, oh my God, what does motherhood look like? Yeah. And what, how would that change everything? And how would I feel? And it just so happened that we had gone to drag con. I don't even know if you know what that is. Awesome. But it's a convention for drag queens. Hell yeah. And drag culture and LGBTQ positive things. Awesome. And we had gone there and 
while we were walking around, I wasn't trying to come up with a show. I wasn't trying to go, what am I going to put on the internet? So people yeah. will like me, <laughs> like I was literally walking around DragCon and I was like, oh my God, I have to do a web series about a woman trying to figure out if she wants to be a mom and connecting with a drag mom. Yes. Like that was, that was, that was the idea. And then everything funneled into place because the idea happened. But I do think like your muse, that, that little idea generating part of your brain has mm -hmm. to be like, you have to, you have to feed it a little bit. Like you have yes. to, you have to celebrate it when ideas come up. And I have always, always, always loved brainstorming. So like same. You're having a problem. You ask me, you, you tell me your problem and I'll just be like, well, what about this? Well, how good about this? What, would this work? And like, I love, I Fuel. love being in the, yeah, I love being in the problem and like going, what can we do to solve it? Which is a lot of fun. Cause then you're working within the constraints of the box or the parameters you find yourself in and you're trying to push against them and see where there's movement and see what you can do. Yeah. And I think for a creative you have to nurture and nourish that part of you that goes, what if, how about, would, could, and instead of just going, nope, that won't work. We don't have enough budget. We can't do that. You Don't tamp it down. Celebrate it and be like, oh my God, that's so cool. And let that fantasy ride out in your mind and encourage that creative inspiration that you have, that curiosity, that imaginative play, that sense of joy because that's where your ideas come from. And that's how you get the fuel to build a train and build the, the train track and send that train up the mountain so that you can actually create something. <laughs> like you, right. you need that fuel from the positive interaction and engagement with your own creative, energetic, inquisitive, imaginative self in order to actually have the energy to generate a project. Cause it takes so much work. Yeah. The working part of it is not the fun part. That's, the slog. <laughs> but, um, but really like make friends with your, I don't want to call it your inner child, but that part of you that like is always saying, well, what if, well, how could, well, what about, you know, that little, that little imaginative pixie sprite in your brain, that's yeah. where you need to, like put your juice and your energy. That's genius. Because the more you feed that, the more comfortable you'll be in exploring that part of creating. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. love that. That's really, really good. Did you write that down? No. Uh, <laughs> no, I just made that up just for you right now. <laughs> I love it. That's so, and that just fosters the idea of feeding your creativity, which then it's like that old saying, it's like the best way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas. Yeah, like just, literally. And, oh. and don't get so precious, but that goes back to like, don't be so precious. Yeah. So like, you then have to be willing to kill your babies. But the trick sure. is you're not killing the babies as they come up, all those ideas. You're going, oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. That's great. And you're exploring the ideas. And only later when you start to have it a little more fleshed out and you're, you've got a little momentum and you're starting to like that train or that, that snowball is rolling, mm -hmm. that's when you start killing things off because you're like, well, I can't literally go 360 degrees down this hill. Sure. I have to find the direction. <laughs> So if I choose path A, that eliminates path Z, but I have to make that choice now. But you're doing that once you've already got some momentum in the creative process. You're not doing it before you've started. And I think that's what people often do is they right. go, well, I can't do that. Or I don't know how to do that. Or that'll cost too much. Or well, what, how, what, what do I know about that? You know, and I don't worry about those things. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What if they were some action figures on the shelf and you're just like, seriously, you thought of that? I was the one that yeah. grew up with action figures. I have action <laughs> figures. You don't even own action figures. I'm like, yeah, but they just like, what do they think about when we're not in here? Right. <laughs> like, you know, like it just, but that's the thing is it, it goes back to that. The what if you have to be open to the, what if could it be? I love that. That is beautiful advice. And cool. just like that, we've been talking for over an hour, Tara, you survived. Hey. I survived. I made it through. Look oh man, this we helmet did. was for nothing. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm keeping mine on. It just makes me feel comfortable. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's a pith helmet, by the way. I just don't want you to think I'm wearing like just a regular construction helmet. It's a pith helmet. Sure. I'm wearing like a beer box made into a helmet. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's good style. <laughs> it fits, it fits. But man, this was good. so fun. Awesome. Wow. Well, thank you for inviting me on the show. Of course. Thanks for agreeing. Because, you know, you didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> But before I let you go, I got to ask, where can people find you online? Where can they find your stuff? Talk to me. Sure. Uh, I am fairly easily searchable online. Um, on Twitter, I'm at 
Tara Platt on Instagram. I'm also at Tara Platt and I have a Perfect. website, taraplatt.com. Oh. Uh, Yuri and I, uh, because we have so many different projects, we have a slew of websites, but we realized it was getting confusing. So we created <laughs> one website Perfect. to try to help people and it's monkey mayhem hub. Uh, dot com. Ooh, I like it. So it's the hub of all of our monkey mayhem that we create. So Beautiful. it's got Monkey King Productions. It's got Bugbot Press, which is our publishing. And it also sends you uh, to a store that you can collect things that you might want of things that we've done. Hell and it yeah. also sends you to our websites as needed. But we, like I said, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, um, and I've got my own website. Um, so those all are my name. So they oh. should be fairly easily found. Get that SEO. I love, right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch! Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I've got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Xavier, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.